Yes, Batman? Where have you been? You're late. I'm sorry, Batman. I was at Chipotle getting myself a burrito. What? And then it appeared to me like a like a vision. I forgot the Tabasco sauce and I had to double back. I mean, I had to go. Are you kidding me? We're interviewing Jonah Berger, the New York Times bestselling author. Who? We're interviewing Jonah Berger. Oh. The Wharton Business College professor. Okay, now I get We are interviewing someone who's kind of a big deal. Well. And you mean to tell me that you went back uh, for extra uh, sauce? You don't have to yell at me. You're just sizzling. You're sizzling, Batman. Calm her down. Calm her down. Calm her down. We're interviewing Jonah Berger, the best-selling author of the new hit book, The Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind. Batman, I just have a quick question. Would you have gone back? No. That's why I was upset. Robin, uh, I need you to understand what I'm saying. I understand. You're saying that if I go to Chipotle again and I have to go back to get extra sauce, I should call you and just tell you that I'm running a little bit late. No, you son of a Batman, would you curse at me? It doesn't make me want to change my mind. Not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. Wouldn't be prudent to change your mind when being yelled at by a yeller. Batman, you should vote for Bernie Sanders. Feel the burn, 2020. Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. We started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, and we'll show you how to get here. We started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, now we're on the top. Teaching you the systems to get what we got. Cutting Dixons on the hooks, I break down the books. Z's bringing some wisdom and the good looks. As the father of five, that's why I'm a dive. So if you see my wife and kids, please tell them hi. It's a C and Z up on your radio. And now three, two, one, here we go. We started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, now we're Yes, 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 and yes, Z. It is ecstasy when you are next to me and you are back from injury. How are you, my friend? I'm I'm alive and kicking, in fact. What is wrong? What's happening? Oh, gosh. We Tell no, us I, something. Tell I, us a little I, something. I just got, I got a little pinched nerve and, uh, you know, so kind of, and then I just did a move, you know, so that yeah. kind of aggravated a little bit. So I've been kind of, my little, my little arm, my little wing. What's weird is when you have a pinched nerve in your neck. Your arm isn't in pain, and yet you have all these sensations in your arm. The, the stinging, the, the burning, the, the I, numbness. I, I want to tell you what I've been doing to get ready for the show today. What, what have you been doing? Well, there's the phrase, no pain, no gain. Well, yeah. So because you're in a lot of pain, yes. we're going to have a lot of gain. Today's, I like that. Today's guest is like a pinch of awesome. You have a pinch of nerve? I, He's a pinch of awesome. I like Jonah that. Berger, welcome on to the Thrive Time Show. How are you, sir? Thanks for having me. I love being called a pinch of awesome. I'll take it. A pinch of awesome. This guy is a Wharton uh, Business School professor. We've had him on the show before. Joni, your book, Contagious. How long ago did you write that book? Oh, wow. Seven years ago now. came out. Seven years. 2013. Seven years ago. Okay. Now, now, um, tell us, how long have you been a professor over there at Wharton? This is my 13th year at Wharton. So I've been there since 2007. So what was your path like that was led to landing this dream job? Because Wharton is one of the most prestigious schools on the planet. What was kind of your path to that job? You know, I'll tell you a, a fun story, which is when I applied to Wharton as an undergrad, I didn't get in. So if oh. uh, any of your listeners are sitting there going, I didn't get into Wharton, you're, you are the same as me. We did not get into Wharton together. <laughs> oh, um, man. Uh, I did, a, I did a Ph.D. Uh, in marketing at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Cool. Uh, and that's where I studied sort of word of mouth, social influence, change, why things catch on, and, uh, and then was uh, lucky enough and fortunate enough to get a job at the Wharton School. Hey, Jonah, now that you're on staff, I yeah. mean, did you ever figure out who it was? I mean, there had to be somebody that said, nah, this kid can't cut it. <laughs> did you ever figure that out? Just, yeah. just out of curiosity, did you ever figure out, oh, that was, that was probably Dr. Johnson said that, or somebody. Did, yeah. Did, no, you, it, did you ever figure out why they didn't let you in? It was that person. <laughs> what, why didn't you get admitted? Uh, Do you, you ever know, figure that out? Getting into college is a, is a hard thing. There are it many, is. Many great students, so you know yeah. it's hard hard to choose among them. All. Your parents didn't have enough money. To, no, Jason, that's a whole other show. That's a whole other show. <laughs> now, now, John, I want to I want to ask you this here because um, you know, a, as a professor, um, you could be writing about a lot of things at the business school, but you recently felt inspired to write this new book, Catalyst: uh, How to Change Anyone's Mind. What inspired you to write this book? 
so after Contagious came out, my life changed quite a, quite a bit. I, I got an opportunity to work with all sorts of companies and organizations from big Fortune 500s like the, the GEs and the Googles and the Apples of the world to small startups and, and everything in between. And, and I realized that everyone, regardless of what industry they're in, regardless of what company size, all had the same problem, which is they all had something – that they wanted to change. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the business owners wanted to change the customers or clients' mind. Leaders wanted to change organizations. And employees wanted to change their bosses' minds. Startups yep. wanted to change their industries. Uh, you know, parents wanted to change their kids' minds. Whatever it might be, we all had something that we wanted to change, but it wasn't working. Uh, you know, often we push, we pressure, we cajole, uh, and no one moves. No one budges. That customer doesn't change their mind. The client doesn't come around. The employees don't change. And so the question I wondered is, is could there be a, a better way? And so I spent the last number of years doing a lot of research, talking to uh, some of the best salespeople, great leaders, uh, people from a variety of industries to understand, could there be a better way to change minds? And if so, what is it? And, and that's what the catalyst is all about. Uh, Paul Hood, you are a CPA. I am. And uh, you went to school for a long time to become a CPA. How long did you go to school to become a CPA? Well, I'm pretty sharp. I only went uh, five years. Five years? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's in college. That's post-high school. Now, you know, actually learn something. And Jonah, just to give you a little background here, um, Dr. Zellner, to my right in the studio here, um, Dr. Z started an optometry clinic, which is the state's, lar state's l largest optometry clinic, the state's largest uh, auto auction. Uh, he has a, a part owner of a bank. He doesn't own a bank. He's part owner of a bank. He wants to declare. He's a declare. Show he's off. Owner of a bank. He has all these successful companies. And, and you, Z, how long did you have to go to school to become an optometrist? Uh, eight years total after after high school. And I've met a lot of broke CPAs, Joe. Most you know, of I've met a lot of broke of CPAs and a lot of broke <laughs> optometrists. And Paul is in the process of building a twenty five thousand or built a twenty five thousand square foot house. So it turns Little out sack. you need to have a money to do that starter home. So I want to ask starter. this question, Jonah. Well, how thing. is it that a CPA like Paul could be so successful? How could a guy like Paul be so successful, and other CPAs? Are not because I feel like it comes down to Paul. You have the ability to change anyone's mind. Sure. So, what questions would you have for Jonah about this? Let's say you're talking to all the CPAs out there, Paul, and you because you've learned how to change people's minds. What question would you have for Jonah about you know how to change people's minds? Because you've learned how to do that, and I've seen Z do that. Right. But most P CPAs can't do it. So, Jonah, the question I have is: is you have a marketing degree, and you know I think all businesses, uh, successful business business owners, are Sell, salesmen, they're marketing people. Um, did you find that a lot of your research actually kind of went over into the um, psychology side of things? If a guy was wanting to study and kind of figure the things out that you mm. did, is it is it more connection or is it actually uh, a sign of the times, you know, that, that, that kind of dictates what's successful and what's not successful? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It's, it's all about that behavioral science. Right? You know, usually when we try to change someone's mind, whether it's a client, whether it's an employee, whether it's a spouse, we think if we just push a little harder, it'll work. If we provide more facts, more reasons, more information, if we just call that client one more time, uh, they'll come around. And it's clear why we have that intuition, right? If there's a chair in front of us and we want it to move, pushing is a good way to get it to move. You want to move that chair in a particular <laughs> direction, pushing works. But for people, pushing often fails for one hmm. very simple reason, which is when you push people, they don't just move like chairs move. They often push back. Right? They often don't go in the direction you want them to. They often go in the exact mm. opposite direction uh, of what you want it to. Mm. And so what this book is all about is, hey, how can we change minds not by pushing, but by actually saying, well, hold on. What are the barriers preventing change? Why hasn't that person changed already? And how can I mitigate those barriers? How can I get rid of the things that are in the way of them doing what I want them to do and, and get them to go along? I think a great analogy, you know, think about getting in a car. Right, you get in a car, it's on a hill, you know, you get in your car, you want it to go, you stick your key in the ignition, you turn your key, you know, you put your uh, foot on the gas pedal and you just push it and you hope the car goes. If the car doesn't go, we think we need more gas. Right? If that client doesn't change, that employee doesn't change, we just think we need to push a little harder. We rarely say, well, hold on, what about the parking brake? Because right, that parking brake is depressed, that car, mm. as much gas as we put in it, is, is not going to go. And so that's what the catalyst is all about. What are those five key common parking brakes that come up again and again that stymie change across a range of situations? And how can we remove those brakes and, and get people to move? John, when, when you're preparing to write your book, how much, uh, let the audience know, how many hours or months or even maybe years did you put into preparing for it? And then, and then second part of that question is, as you were gathering and preparing and writing it, were there any big surprises to you? 
Yeah, I mean, so I've spent uh, over a decade in some way, shape, or form writing pieces uh, of, of this book. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've interviewed everything from uh, top salespeople and top leaders to, uh, you know, um, uh, hostage negotiators who got people to come out with their hands up to substance abuse counselors who got people to quit. Yeah, uh, wow. even a, a cantor uh, who is a religious person who's able to get a, a Klansman to renounce the, the KKK. So looking at Whoa. all sorts of change from a variety uh, of different angles. And I think the thing that surprised me the most is this this approach, this, this way of thinking about change. I think, you know, we tend to think that pushing works. And I, I've done uh, study after study of this where I ask people in a variety of industries, yeah. what's something you want someone to change and how can you get them to change? And over 98% of the time, it's some version of pushing. We just tend to default to that approach. Right. <laughs> we rarely think about the barriers, rarely recognize what those barriers are. We're so focused on ourselves what we want. We don't think a lot about that person who we're trying to change, right. what's stopping them and, and how we can help. You know, Jonah, I, uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which uh, Warren Buffett said that that single book changed his life. And I'd kind of liken your book to it's almost like how to win friends and influence people part two and you go deeper. You know what I mean? It's like you're really getting into the psychology of it. You really do get into the research of it. How much money Do you think it costs a CPA or an optometrist per year to not know how to change anyone's mind? I mean, for the entrepreneurs out there that own a company that just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. I mean, have you ever thought about that, Jonah? I mean, how much money could it be costing somebody if they have the branding right, the marketing right, the website right? They got all that. They have the degree right. They have all the education, but they just can't change someone's mind. How much money is it costing people? Oh, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars easily, if if not more. I mean, I, agree. I think the thing is, you know, we often think about that one client that we can't get to come around. Oh yeah. But if we're really good at this stuff, we're not just convincing that one client. We're convincing dozens of clients. True. We're convincing other people to want to join us and become employees. We're growing that business from that you know one person CPA firm we might be to to dozens of people. We're not doing the work anymore. We're managing teams. We got to learn how to manage those teams, right? And so this is a skill whether you're you know getting a client to come around or whether you're trying to manage more people and get them to, to come around. I, I love the link to Dale Carnegie, and that book is a fantastic one, but we've learned a lot since that book was written. That's right? true. That book is decades old. Yeah. We've learned a lot about behavioral science since then, and it, it's really exciting to be able to share some of that science with people through this book. Yeah. Jonah, I got one more question for you. So this is very interesting. I can't, I've already, I just ordered your book on, on my phone. I can't wait, wait to read it because you know, I deal with business owners. We teach them success principles. A lot of our business owners are really aggressive, you know, type A personalities. And I've said for years, okay, if you step towards somebody, if you, you step towards that person, somebody, they have a natural tendency to step back. And so trying to teach a person that that is uh, a type A personality to just stand still Um, So do you see that, too? I mean, have have you thought about that or addressed that to where people have a tendency, like you say, is to push your chair? I guess that's what you're trying to say is when somebody pushes the chair, they can either push back or the chair can just take off running when it's a person, correct? Yeah. You know, someone said it so nicely. They said, you know, you need to stop selling and figure out how to get people to buy in. And I think mm. that's exactly right. You know, I talk about five key barriers in the book. The first one's reactance. And, and the basic idea of reactance is, you know, people like to feel like they're in control. And when you tell them to do something, when you pressure them, they don't feel like they're in control. They feel like you're in control. And what do we do when we feel like other people control? We, we push back. And essentially, people have an, an ingrained anti-persuasion radar almost like a, an anti-missile defense system or like a spidey sense of, of sorts where their defenses go up. When, when um, uh, someone's trying to change their mind, they know it's happening, and so they push back. They push back against it. They say, I don't, I don't want to change uh, my mind. They either avoid the persuasion attempt. They ignore it. Think about when that salesman calls, for example. You get that email that you don't want. We ignore or we avoid it, or even worse, right? we counter-argue. That person sitting there, it seems like they're listening, but they think you really think about all the reasons why what you're suggesting is wrong. And so one tip I talk about in the book to reduce reactance is essentially to provide some sense of, of choice. Right. So imagine you're you're pitching someone, for example, right? You're sitting there, you're saying, This is the right course of action. Uh, often that person sitting there is thinking, oh, this is going to be too expensive, or it's not going to work, or sure, it worked for that type of client, but it's not going to work for me. They're thinking about all the reasons why what you're suggesting is wrong. But if you provide them with multiple options, two rather than one, or maybe two even three, True. suddenly it shifts their role very importantly. 
rather than sitting there thinking about all the reasons why what you suggested is wrong, they're thinking about which of those options you suggested they like best, which means they're much more likely to pick one of them at the end of the conversation. Right, Because now rather than being lectured to or being told what to do, yep. they're participating. You've guided that choice. You've guided their journey. They're much more bought in and much more likely to go along. Jonah, do you like the Tiny Desk show on YouTube? I have, I have seen a little bit of it, yes. You got it. You got to really be watching some some tiny desk in your life. I'm it's gonna change your life. But you'll get like you know a hip hop artist performing in a stripped down version on. It's like a PBS, but it's performing. It's, tiny desk is a great great show. Everybody out there hasn't seen it. But imagine you had a tiny desk. Okay, so you're doing a tiny desk show, and in the room it's you, President Trump, and Bernie. Mm. Mm. And you are <laughs> sitting down with room. these. But and then there's no there's no crowd though. We're not playing to the crowd now. No, We're playing just, to Jonah. Yeah. Just Jonah. And you're sitting down, and you're going, guys, 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 guys. guys. And we, we, we eventually get them to stop doing what they're doing. And you say, now, I, what I want you guys to do is I'm going to teach you, Mr. Trump, or you, Mr. Bernie, how to change the other guy's mind. So you're going to pull Bernie aside, and you're going to tell him. Now, you're not going to tell Trump that you're doing this. So you're going to pull Bernie aside and say, Bernie, here's the deal. I'm going to teach you the secrets. This is how you're going to change his mind, or vice versa. What? Could political candidates like a like a Trump or a Bernie Sanders, what could they do better in your mind when doing these debates to not make them so divisive? Even if they have different worldviews, what could the other party do to potentially change the other party's mind? Now, again, I realize in modern politics, you're playing to a crowd and you're trying to get people to cheer and you attack each other and make crazy statements. So I'm just saying if you were actually sitting down, and you were coaching Mr. Sanders or Mr. Trump on how to influence the other person. What kind of advice would you give to politicians? Yeah, you know, I've, I've worked with a number of politicians, and I, I share a, a few political examples in the book. And I think part of the problem is, as you outlined, it's, it's almost like a football field, right, where the Democrats are on one end and the Republicans are on the other. Yes. Um, and yeah, there's some moderates in between, but, you know, when Democrats say, hey, you should believe this, Republicans say, well, that's really far away from where I am at the moment. No, thanks. And vice versa. When Republicans say, you know, oh, you should do X, Y, Z, Democrats say, well, that's pretty far from where I am. Yep. Sometimes when we ask for too much, it almost gets disregarded, right? It's almost outside. Our, our zone of acceptance. It gets in that region of rejection yeah. where it's so far away we don't even want to think about it. And so one thing I talk a lot about in the book is, is how can we ask for less? You know, we want big change to happen right away. I get it. We all, we all want big change to happen right away, but sometimes we got to be a little patient. I was talking to this doctor who's a great example of this, right? So doctor was talking to a trucker who's morbidly obese, way overweight, drinking like three liters of Mountain Dew a day. Um, and what does that doctor <laughs> want to tell the trucker to do? Stop drinking soda, right? Of course, cut out the soda, right. which is exactly what the Democrats and Republicans want to do. They say, switch to my side right away. All your ideas are wrong. Cold turkey, all baby. Right. Yeah, which is not going to happen. Right? That, that trucker's not going to quit drinking Mountain Dew. Those so truckers love does, Mountain Dew. They love it. <laughs> they, oh, they love it. So, so instead, she says, hey, instead of three liters a day, just drink two and fill up that third bottle with some water. Have it in the cab of your truck. You can drink the water um, and you know refill it in the truck stop. He complains about it, grumbles, but is able to do it. Right. Next time he comes back, he's down to two. Then he says, okay, go from two, now go to one. He grumbles and then goes away, goes down to one. Next, he says, okay, now go down from one to zero. He does it and eventually loses over 35 pounds because what she did is she didn't just ask for less. She asked for less mm. and then asked for more. Essentially what she did is she took big change and broke it down into smaller chunks. I think that's the same thing we've got to think about in yep. politics, right? Stop asking people to completely change in a moment. Just find a piece of common ground, switch that field a little bit, break down a big ask into smaller, more manageable chunks. It's like stepping stones as you jump across a river, making people much more likely to, to come for the ride. I want to talk about these five key parking brakes. And I also want people to actually buy the book. I mean, Paul, you know how it works. You're, you're a CPA. It turns out you have to sell a book, right, to make money. Is that how that works? Yeah, isn't that weird? Yeah. Weird. Okay. So we want people to buy the book. We don't give away all the moves, Jonah, but we want to give away enough of the moves. We're teaser. shameless we'll entrepreneurs that we want everyone to want the book. Uh, you've already bought the book there, Paul. Yep. I, I bought the book. Jonah, can we go through a few more of these parking breaks? Sure. Yeah, happy to. So, so I talk about five in the book, yep. um, uh, and they're actually part of an acronym. So the first is reactance. We talked a little about that. The second is endowment. That's the E. The third is distance. That's D. U is uncertainty, and C E is corroborating evidence. Put those five together, they spell reduce, which is exactly what what good catalysts do. Uh, we talked a little about reactance already. Uh, we talked a little about distance. If you're too far away, it gets disregarded. But one I think um, your listeners might find useful is this idea of uncertainty. And one thing we often forget is that any time we're asking someone to change, 
there's some fear, some anxiety there. Truth. Right? New things are new things are always riskier than old things. Even if old things are bad, we know how that old thing works. Right. You know, sure it might not be perfect, right? Uh, but we know that old thing. People often talk about their spouses this way. It's like, yeah, my spouse isn't perfect, right? But you know, I know, I know what the challenges are. Whereas new things are really risky. And so anytime you're asking someone to change, you're asking them to go from a sure thing to a, a risky new thing. You're yeah. asking them to, to take a switch from what they know to something they often uh, don't know. And there's a lot of cost to doing that. Not only is there time or energy or effort, it's often expensive to change. And so one thing I talk a lot about is how can we reduce that uncertainty? How can we, in a sense, lower the barrier to trial, make it easier for people to try what we're offering. So think about Dropbox, for example. Many of you guys have used Dropbox. You know, Every day. Online storage. Yeah, a wonderful system, right? So, so they come out. Um, originally, they say, hey, we're going to store your stuff in the cloud. People go, where's the cloud? Right? What if the cloud goes down? They don't want to try this new technology because they don't know how it works. And so rather than saying, okay, we'll make it cheap, or rather than saying, hey, we'll buy a lot of ads, what they say is, look, we'll give you some for free. We'll give you two gigabytes of storage for free. It's not an infinite amount of storage for free, but it's just enough so you get a sense of what it's like. So if you like it, you're willing to upgrade. Why? Because rather than them trying to convince you, you've convinced yourself. And so what lowering the barrier to trial is, is how can we give people a taste and experience, almost like a test drive of what we're offering? Going back to CPA, if I'm a CPA, of course I say I'm great. Right? Of course I say you should switch your business to me from someone else. No CPA is going to say, no, no, stay with your old CPA. So we have to think about, well, how can I show you that I'm great? How can I give you an experience that allows you to realize how great I am so you convince yourself rather than me convincing you? Jonah, uh, uh, I want to I want to get I want the listeners out there to get a chance to, to know you, you know, uh, know you as, as a person here. Um, did you remember? Uh, can you remember picture in your mind? Can you, can you think back to like your eighth grade school dance? Eighth grade. I can actually. This, scarily enough, I can. Yeah. <laughs> what was your jam? Like, I'm, what I'm was the song? By the way, to Whitney Houston's "I Will Always Love You." Oh, oh, nice. oh there you go. Nice. Well done. Nice. Well done. That's the jam. Okay. Give him a mega point. He gets a mega you, point. You get for that. one mega point for that. He gets a mega point. Uh, I think that's fair. Now let me ask you this. Now, who are your who are your favorite music artists right now? Or a couple of them where you go, man, I really like I really this group. This just, give us, just give us, just give us. We we need Come to on. know the personal life, the deep dark secrets. Of we won't share it with anybody. No. Just between us. Just us and a half just million us. people. Just, 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 just let, let us. Just, just let us know. You know, what's scary, by the way, is I thought you were going to ask me who I was dancing with at that eighth grade dance. I thought oh. it was going to be even even worse than who I was listening to music wise. Um, uh, in terms of music, yeah. you know, I like all sorts of stuff. I like everything from country to, to hip hop to rock and, and everything in between. I, I find uh, uh, at the moment I like a lot of indie rock, mellow stuff. I have a new baby in the house, so oh, wow. anything that sort of keeps wow. it mellow and, and light is is good for me at the moment. That's not from the same girl you danced with it in eighth grade, is it? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah just curious. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. No. Okay, well, okay, that's go. good. That's good. That's good. I'm never making a point there. Yeah. Okay, so now you um you your 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 book is a, is obviously the book's called Catalyst. This is a, an awesome book for people to read. But I want to ask you because you, you, to write a book it, t- it requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of focus, a lot of energy. How do you organize the first four hours of your day? Because you are a professor, you're a speaker, you're a writer. How do you organize the first four hours of your day? And what time do you typically you know get started? Yeah, you know, people talk a lot about big rocks and little rocks, and I think it's such a good analogy, right? There's a tendency to want to start with the little stuff, right? Just to do all the little stuff, and eventually once we get the little stuff done, we'll go to the big stuff. But sometimes if you don't make time for the big stuff, it it never happens, right? If you pour all the little rocks in, there's not enough room for the big rocks. If you pull the big rocks in first, the little rocks sit around them. And so I think you really got to be protective of your time, right? You got to say, what is that big thing I want to accomplish today or this week, writing a book? Not fun, let me tell you, right? So it's, it's me locking myself in that room and saying, what's the chapter I've got to get through today? What's the idea I want to focus on today? Let me do that, and, and then I'll do some of the small stuff. What, uh, what time do you start the day typically? Well, I'd probably start around 7 a.m., something like that. 7 a.m., okay. And then where are you starting today? Do you, do you work out of your house? Do you go to, 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 to Wharton to work from the campus? Star- uh, or maybe a Starbucks to get a latte. Where, where do you, where do you, I, where do you, I, I walk to work with my cane every day. I swing my cane around ooh, and my ooh. top hat. And I'm wow. Really that to work. Uh, <laughs> That's no, no, impressive. I also, skipping? I bet I, I can see him skipping. He's skipping down <laughs> the sidewalk. I, I start from home. I find it's, it's good to you know greet the day from home. Sometimes in those sweatpants and that T-shirt. You know, don't, don't start too heavy. Ease yourself into it often. For the listeners out there that are, are thinking about it, and, and we have time for two more questions. We're going to go lightning round here. So, Paul, get, get be ready, and Z, I'm be ready. ready. But here we go. Well, I'm ready. For the listeners out there who are thinking about buying the book, 
But they got a, it's a tight budget situation. We, we, we might go oh to Chipotle Come on now. twice this week. Each time oh we go, it's Lord. $8 for a burrito. Give up a burrito or two. And we're going, it's a tight time for me. I might go on iTunes and buy 19 songs in the next 60 days that I'll listen to one time. I might do this. Or, or I might buy a book that could change, change my, my life. life. Uh, why should everybody pick up a copy of your book? Because I am sold out to the idea that emotional intelligence is super important, and I have never met a super successful person who it does well in the game of life who cannot change people's minds. That's my reason, but why should everybody pick up this book? So I'll actually say t- two things. Don't, don't believe me. Go to my website. Mm. There's some free resources there. Check mm. them out. If you find them useful, get the book. And by the way, if you get the book and you hate the book, Email me and I will send you your money back. Wow! I'm that sure wow. that people will find this book valuable, that I'm that I'm happy to send them their money back. I think there's there's tips and tricks and useful stuff in there for yep. everyone, whether you're a small business owner, uh, a big business owner, and there's a bunch of free stuff on my website, resources. Uh, whether you're trying to change a boss's mind, change a client's mind, there's a bunch of free stuff people can dig into there. If you're not sure yet about the book, it'll give you some sense of what the ideas are. I think it's really useful stuff, and I, I want to make sure people can get access to it. Paul Hood, rapid fire question before. Z one ups all of us with the, with the ultimate question. Always, he yeah. always one up just when he walks in the room. So the question I have is is you know again we deal with businesses, startup businesses to businesses that that have 50, 60 employees already. Mm. Um, would you say that this book has uh, a benefit to to really anybody that wants to grow their business, that wants to truly market? Because we have a tendency to people think. Um, marketing is just going out and buying ads and all of that, but the reality is, is that connection that 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 people that spread your you know tell your story. So um, my question is, is there a target for a specific a specific size of business that you would be after this bus- this book? No, it, it's really all about the goal that you have in mind, right? That that thing that you want to change. I've worked with small businesses. It's tough being a small business owner. You don't have a big budget. I've worked with a lot of medium size or sort of high growth businesses that are trying to take it to the next level. But the challenges, while they're somewhat different, are also often very much the same. And you've got limited resources, and you got to make a lot of those resources. And so it's really about thinking about, you know, what is that behavioral science that gets people to change, and how can we harness them to move them in the right direction? Jonah, uh, now Z, Z, Z is going to one up us all with the ultimate question, but I, I want to ask you, sir, will you um, ban the selling of your books to communist dictators? Will you do that for me? <laughs> I think they need it more than anybody. Like Wait, no, we don't want them to change people's minds. I don't want the communist leaders changing people's I don't, minds. I mean, my goodness, Jonah, this, could a you book com- like this in Kim Jong Sung's hand, what, what, what could happen? Could, could you commit to not selling this to communist dictators? Is that a pledge you would take for us? Please. I'm, I'm happy to make that pledge. Okay, oh, he lost you. like six or seven book sales right there, just alone, okay. right there at All the right. top. All right, so back to you. Back to you. Okay. Back to you. Uh, you know, this is an interesting concept, and I, and I love the premise of the book, um, how to change anyone's mind. And I know this isn't our listening audience because we're all entrepreneurs oh, and yeah. capitalists and we're people out there Not trying all. to sell uh, goods or service. Shameless. But, uh, you know, occasionally somebody may click on the I, I, you know, click on this podcast or the radio show and go, what are they talking about? What What's are they going talking on? about on that show? What's happening? Isn't that, I mean, you're manipulating someone's mind? Oh. Are, are, are you, are you? Is this ethical? What changing someone's mind? Are you a dark lord? I mean, are you like? Is this? Is this a dark? Are you controlling? Is Is this this like you're taking over the world? Is this the Illuminati? Is this part of the Matrix? Is this? Am I plugged in or plugged out? Part of the Federal Reserve? I mean, is this manipulation at the highest level? It's like a chiropractor of the mind. I mean, is this? Are you are you putting things in my brain that don't belong there? This is artificial intelligence. (laughs) What is going on? I don't control myself anymore. No, I mean. What do you, what do you, how do you answer that for the average Joe out there that may be listening and goes, you know what, that just mm. doesn't, that doesn't sound like, I mean, I don't want someone sounds changing like my devil. mind. I mean, that just sounds, sounds like something wrong or like something dirty. Book. Sounds sounds like written a demon guy's book. Inside my, he's inside my brain or something. So I'll say, I'll say two things. Okay. Uh, first, uh, there were some earlier views on Amazon. And one of the earlier views basically said, this book is too useful because it will change people's minds and salesmen and you know manipulators will use it. And so don't read this book because it's bad because the tools are useful. And they gave it a, a low review as a result. And I was actually like, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty happy. I that's actually that a good review. review. I reason, think, I'm, yeah. yeah if, you're, if you're worried about this book because it's too effective and you're worried about the wrong people using it, I'm pretty happy about I'm that. I'm pretty happy. You know, and what I would say is, again, tools are tools. 
right? You know, you can do right. good things with a hammer and you can do bad things with a hammer. Right. So just the fact that they're tools doesn't mean they're, they're good or bad. It's Come how on. we use them. And, and I think what's great about something, even like uncertainty, right? Take Dropbox, what they did with giving away a free trial. Right. If the product's not good, it's not going to work. Right. By giving away something for free, lowering the barrier to trial, giving people experience. If your thing's terrible, you don't have a word of mouth problem or a marketing problem. You got a product or a service problem. Right. Right. And so these tools are useful, but they're going to be more useful the better your thing is. And so if you don't have yep. a big budget, you don't have a lot of resources, these tools are going to be great. If you got a product or service that isn't quite great, well, then you got to work on that product or service. Joan, I want to I want to complain here before we wrap up. I have a complaint I want want to is share. This with is a certified you. complaint. This, this is a certified certified official complaint. Joan, I want to complain for a second here. Your book is endorsed by a, a Daniel Pink. Okay. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a mega point. Okay, Daniel Pink. Was, he's, he's been on the show. It's endorsed by Jim Collins. That's also a mega point. Now, Z, we've had the founder of Netflix reach out to us this week to be on the show. Oh, cool. We've had the founder of Square reach out to us to be on the show. We have uh, uh, Wolfgang Puck has been on the show. He's been on the show. Guy Kawasaki has been on the show. On the show. But you know who has rejected me more than almost anybody? Who? Jimmy oh C. Jimmy Jimmy's Collins. No way. So, Wharton, uh, Mr. Wharton here, Mr. Jonah, if at any point you could give him a copy of your book and, and inside it, you know, when you, when you sign the book if th that he's endorsed, just oh, say- a personalized book. That's always a good Please move. book my good friend, Clay, and use your Jedi mind <laughs> tricks to get him on the show. Yeah. Because you need to change use his mind. Use your tool for good, Jonah. Jonah, use it use, for good. Use it for good. And he only rejects me because he has class and style and standards and all the things. Well, apparently, we, we tricked you into being on our show. But he, could you could you maybe work on him on the side a little? Kind of, well, I'm I will, I will work on that. I'll put that on my to-do list today. Oh, Jimmy oh, C. Jimmy oh C. Oh. Oh. oh, folks, buy Jonah's oh, book, and he will give us Jimmy them. C. There's a half million of you that are begging for Jimmy C. Email me all the time saying, I want Jimmy C. I, I want, want Jimmy C. C. And we want to say yes, but Jonah's not going to do it unless he sees some immediate sales. Buy the book right now. Do it. The Catalyst, Click. How to Change Anyone's Mind. The Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind. Jonah, I appreciate you, my friend. You you offer an unbelievable value. You are the man. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. It was, it was awesome to be here. <sighs> you, you, this, this was a whale of a show. He's Z. a stud. I don't. I, I we get him twice. First time I understand how you trick people. The second time he thought this was I'm, the Jim, Jim Collins podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jonah. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Later, guys. And now, without any further ado, three, two, one, boom. If you don't understand you're the one, you won't understand why you're being attacked like you're being attacked. Whenever the enemy knows that the one is coming, he always sets traps to stop them from succeeding because they're the one. And to him whom much is given, much is required. And so the text starts out talking about Abraham because Abraham is the one. And Abraham had to move out from his country and away from his kindred because he was the one. So he was a misfit because he was the one. So he didn't get to stay because he was the one. So he had to live in isolation because he was the one. So he probably was lonely because he was the one. Because he was the one. Because he was the one. New city, new state, it's gonna be a mean race All the sins that I have done, I'm grateful for a clean slate Felt like I was different, I ain't never try to prove it though Stack your chips, get on your grind, don't never make excuses, bro Solid as a rock, loyalty is all I ever know Doing what you've always done, then homie, you can never grow Conversations with the Lord, I ask him what I ever blow Told me I got dead weight, so friends, I gotta let them go We don't make it, I know they think hating, it's all in their faces We desperate for greatness, I said, I been patient I know it's my moment, no stopping, we going this thing is in motion, uh, what you gon' do when your back's against the wall? You gon' stand up like a champ or you gon' curl up in the ball? I'm the one, I've been chosen, so I'm riding through it all. Gotta keep your faith up so you can rise and never fall. Let's go. And Abraham had to move out from his country and away from his kindred because he was the one. So he didn't get to stay with his kinfolks because he was the one. They are always on the hit list because hell knows that he is the one. I want to talk to some people that have been up under crazy attack. And to him who much is given, much is required. The devil's been attacking, I ain't stressing from it. Cause every time that happened, there's a blessing coming. Obsessing over problems that you can't change. I have you going crazy, learn your lesson from it. 
Remember when they cut my water off, homie? Man, reflecting how they cut my lights off, too. Dog, I had to move back in with my mama. Had me feeling like a failure, that's what life would do. Gotta get up on your grind, I had to make the right move. Raymond noodles every night, I had some beans and rice, too. Execution is the key, don't tell me what you might do. Favor from the man above, no other god is like you. You can knock me down, but I promise I ain't staying there. Feeling like I am the one, we just begun, let's make it clear. Me and Clay clicking up, y'all don't even get it, bruh. About to be colossal, taking over when we rip it up, hey. And Abraham had to move out from his country and away from his kindred because he was the one. So he didn't get to stay with his kinfolk because he was the one. They are always on the hit list because hell knows that he is the one. I want to talk to some people that have been up under crazy attack. And to him who much is given, much is yeah. Yeah. yeah, started from the bottom, now I'm here. Uh. Hoping I'd success after 23 years. Uh. Got the dragon energy, got another gear. Uh. Got a superpower, man, I call persevere. Uh. Cause I never have a thought people call fear. Uh. I never stop writing when the future's not clear. Uh. We're gonna be dead soon and I'm just being, being real. Uh. So I'll be paralyzed by the thoughts that we feel. So you'll stop begging for people to come into agreement with you. So you'll stop doing polls and census and trying to get everybody to come into consensus with your vision so that you won't need nobody to say amen when you preach because you already know that you got heaven saying amen. The power of one. Listen to the entire T.D. Jakes sermon, Grasping the Moment, by visiting T.D. Jakes' YouTube channel, simply named T.D. Jakes. Shut up!